Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Zach Taylor. I'm the Digital Lab and Online Learning Manager here at SFW, and we are just about ready to get started. One final reminder before I hand it off to Reed Callanan, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat function. There, I'm going to periodically be putting into that chat links to both videos and eBooks from JP and Sean. Make sure you keep a lookout for those links and check them out if you're interested. At this time, it is our 6 p.m. Mountain Time start time. So at this moment, I would like to invite in Reed Callanan to get the program started. Reed. Thank you, Zach. Good evening, everyone. I'm Reed Callanan. And I am pleased to say on behalf of all of us at Santa Fe Workshops, welcome to this special evening. And I'm happy to say that creativity continues here at Santa Fe Workshops. I've got my Santa Fe Workshop mug, of course, filled with water. I'm all set to go. I hope you are too. I, I saw some of the chats earlier this evening and some people are having problem with audio. Uh, just know that uh, these this evening is recorded, and so if for some reason technically you're not uh, able to to tune in to the full presentation, it'll be reported recorded, and we'll send you a link to it so you can watch it at some other time. And I'm, I'm sorry about uh, the technical issues that appear to be happening with some of you. So anyway, um, over the last thirty years, we have I think done a pretty good job of building community here at the workshops in Santa Fe, in San Miguel, in, in Cuba. But it's a, it's a no, new world now and um, a new world order of things. And we're working hard to build that same kind of community here online. And Creativity Continues is one of these ways that uh, we do this. So thank you for joining us tonight as we um, restart this program. We took a hiatus this summer but this is the very first presentation this fall of a number of presentations in this, in this free series. So um, stay tuned to our newsletter and that will give you updates on the program that we have continuing uh, throughout the rest of the year into, into next year. So um, tonight I'm, I'm happy to say that we're taking on a topic that you would think that we would deal with, with a program called Creativity Continues, but it's actually the first time in over a year of this series that we've actually named this subject and, um, and found people that wanted to talk about it for an hour plus. And so the genesis of this happened back in January when I got an email from John Paul, who said that he would love to do a program with us and he would like it to be a conversation with one of his friends and creativity was the topic that he picked to, um, to kick this, this um, ongoing series off with us. And so we both thought about uh, people that would be good to do it with. And we both agreed that uh, Sean Kernan, a longtime friend of both of ours would be the perfect person to do it with. So JP got in touch with Sean and of course Sean said yes. And here we are today with two longtime friends who have uh, worked together collaboratively before and will again tonight, I'm sure. Creativity is uh, an elusive idea. It's a um, kind of a, a little bit of a nebulous topic, but it's one that's so important to us as creative people. Where does it come from? Why does it go? Where do we find it when it's gone? Why are some places more creative than others? Lots of, lots of things that can be discussed. And I'm sure that, that JP and Sean are gonna um, come close to exhausting some of the things that they have um, <clears throat> thought about and written about and read over the next hour. So I'm excited to hear what they have in store for us and what's, um, what's up. So both of these gentlemen have longstanding relationships with Santa Fe Workshops. Sean first started teaching with us in 1992 and JP followed in 1996, and they've been teaching with us ever since. So um, I've known both of, of these fine people for over 25 years. And it's an honor for me to welcome them to the stage, so to speak, and to thank them for, for being here and coming up with this uh, idea and, um, and being here with us tonight. So. Welcome the two of you. 
Hi, Sean. Hey, JP. Hey, Reed. Nice to see you all. Good to see you too. Before I turn it over to the two of you, I want to uh, tell the folks listening in that the, the program is going to be a little over an hour tonight. Uh, these two have about 50 minutes planned of conversation and images and ideas. And then we're going to take a, take a little um, break from, not a break, but then we're going to stop that and go to your questions. So as they progress through the next 50 minutes, as questions pop into your mind, feed them into the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom right-hand side of your Zoom platform. Do not feed them into the chat feature. They're two different things. The chat is for communicating with, with Zach um, or just leaving a comment for the whole audience to see. Uh, use the Q&A for your questions. And then at that point, Zach and I will take turns asking questions of Sean and JP. So, uh, and we'll probably go 10, maybe 15 minutes after the hour. So that's the, the plan for uh, our time together. So I'll now turn it over to the two of you, Sean and JP, take it away. Thank you, Reed. Thank, well, thank you for you, uh, sure. creating and, and gathering this community. I, I look forward to many more gatherings. I know it's always inspiring. Um, we have a lot to touch on tonight, so we're going to kind of move brief, briskly. Um, we certainly can't cover everything, but uh, I think we've got something pretty special for you tonight. As, as you mentioned, Reed, um, we've all known each other for decades, and Sean and I consider tonight a continuance of our more than 25-year conversation on creativity and the process and the mindset and sometimes the tools. Um, you can read and listen to uh, more of what we've been up to over the years on my website and on Sean's. Um, I'm really delighted to start with Sean here. Sean is, to my mind, one of the photographers I enjoy speaking with the most because he's unusually articulate. And I truly enjoy how he thinks and approaches creativity. It's quite different than the way I approach creativity. And yet there are so many parallels and overlaps. It's almost like being in a hall of mirrors. And one of the things I've come to find is that uh, you never know exactly where you're going to go. Uh, it's true with the creative process. It's, it's never more true than when you're having a conversation with, with Sean. So some of this is going to be improvisation. I think that's the very thing that's going to keep it alive. Um, we both study and teach creativity. Uh, I think we have most of our lives. You might even call us restlessly curious, which might be some of the foundation, the very spark of creativity. I've taken his creativity workshop with several other instructors, including Jay Maisel and Greg Heisler. Uh, we found ourselves making marks with ink, uh, doing movement exercises, and writing before our final assignment to extend the photograph, which was a fabulous assignment, and the responses were wonderful. Uh, Sean works with actors like Alan Arkin and dancers like Allison Chase, and that is very much felt in his workshop and in his approach. It's just, it's a very different approach than anyone else that I've run into. And that's what makes it so wonderful. So we both do a lot of different things creatively. I write poetry and flash, draw, paint, collage, sculpt, play keyboard. For starters, Sean writes novels, acts, practices Asian calligraphy and plays flamenco guitar, for starters. <laughs> and all of that informs our primary medium photography. Uh, in, in really vital ways. And so it's one of the things I'd like to start with, just with a kind of quick rapid fire set of questions before Sean shows you. First, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but we're, we're gonna do this very briskly because there's so much we could say about each one of these. So Sean, I wanted to start by, what did you learn by playing flamenco guitar? Um, I, learned, I learned that I probably shouldn't have started and if I was going to start, I should be arranged to be born in Granada in a gypsy household. Uh, you know, lear lear learning things like music or Chinese or things, there's a certain age uh, after which it's not going to be very rewarding uh, for anybody else or for you. And the age, I think, is about five, maybe younger. All right. <laughs> um, Let's, let's push further in, into some of your practices. Share something you learned about acting, by acting. I, acting is wonderful. Um, started 
some years ago when I brought, asked Alan Arkin to come into my class at the New School and uh, work with us. And as I watched this, I just, I could see things opening up in people in a way that you would want to have it happen in any medium, but uh, it's so immediate. It happens on the spot. You get it right away. You're, you, you, there's no way around it. There's no way you can break away from it. So it's, it's, it's being right in the fire all the time. And it's, it can, it, it's just delightful and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> what on earth did you learn practicing Asian calligraphy? Oh, I, I, I learned, I had a contact with this woman who died a few years ago at age 103. Mm. Uh, and she took me to another universe, uh, a kind of China that doesn't even exist anymore. And I, I learned to do something that I felt that I had no way to learn how to do it, except by making something that looked kind of Chinese. And that's, that's really what did it. And she, she said to me at one point, she said, you're my second best student. So I was honored. <laughs> How about writing? Fiction, I believe poetry as well, other things. How did writing influence the way you see? I thought I thought I was going to be a writer to begin with. That's that's what that's what my uh, teenage vision was. Um, the, the, to, to be a writer or a musician or a painter or calligrapher for that matter, that what's really required required is not a skill with words or facility but an ability to be totally present and totally awake and not trying to do something, but allowing something to come to you. And the thing that comes to you is always bigger than you are when it comes out. How does that work? I don't know, but there it is. Mm. And it applies to, to any, any, any form you care to work in really. I think. So my next two questions are what you learn by making videos or motion pictures and by making photographs. But also I know that you've prepared something for us and, and you may just want to show us rather than tell us. Your call. Uh, was that a question? <laughs> it was a way of letting you out of two questions at once. <laughs> Scripted, by the way, wasn't it? Yeah. As, a, as a, somebody who spent a lifetime, not a lifetime, not yet, uh, working in photography, um, video, video opened a door that I didn't know was there. And it brought me to a different understanding of what my responsibilities are and how to work beyond what I know, how to work in discomfort mm -hmm. and, and realize that that's a good place to be, to find things out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not knowing, not knowing, not knowing. Right. It's a big theme in, in your work. Um, maybe it's the ground from which discovery can rise up. I wish it were some other way. I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I knew. I, I've relaxed with it. No, I haven't. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm going to turn this over to you. I know we're eager to see what you've assembled for us, both stills and, and video. And I know it's, it's a beautiful presentation. I look forward to seeing it. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to, and thinking about how to put this together of all these years of doing presentations and uh, here's my work from this place or that place or this subject. I, um, I came across a quote and I'll, I'll read it to you in a second, but I, in, in putting this presentation together, I decided that I, rather than being categorical, I would just put things that did something that was beyond what I had in mind, uh, and I would put them together with other things that had no relation to it in terms of subject uh, mm. or, or, or goal uh, thing that I was working on and see how they, how they work together um, and see what happens. So, and I also threw in something I've never done before, um, which is uh, some, some of the work that I did for a living. So you'll, you'll see some of that. It'll be easy to see I think what those are in most cases, and they, you know, they borrow some some of those skills. Now I'm going to dive in here and find this. 
My wife says I make funny little noises when I try to concentrate on something. Okay. Um, back to Zoom and screen share. Where is screen share? There he is. Okay. Okay. Got that? We are seeing it. You're good to go. Okay. So this is uh, this is the name of this little presentation. And this is the quote that I came across just a few weeks ago. I don't know if you know Roger Ballant's work, but it is uncanny and hard to describe with words. Um, and I thought that's that's the thing. Not not how not how well you fulfilled something is not the work that I'm looking for. It's the work that that goes far beyond anything that I have in mind. I hope I hope it happens in some of these. Anyway, there we go. I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to comment on things. I have to say, I got this from your father, JP, this thistle.
The same person, and he was in my very first photography class I ever taught. So that's about 35 or 40 years of work. <laughs> and you look at it that way, God. Anyway, I, uh, the next thing I'm gonna show you, another series of stills, I'm not gonna explain it. I'm not gonna say what it is, you'll find out a little bit later.
know, that's... <laughs> okay. I'm trying to stop sharing. I can't find my mouse. Hmm. Hold on. Go ahead and hit your escape key, Sean. I can stop it oh, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Got it. Uh, anyway, that's what it's really all about. That, that wasn't supposed to be in there. Um, now, I want to show you something else. That This will explain that last set of pictures, and this will also be what John Paul kind of referred to as uh, being a comparison between uh, stills and film. Um, this was my COVID madness project, one of them anyway. And um, oh, where is it? God, I can't find. Okay, hold on. Everybody just sit tight there. What are you seeing now? Me fumbling around, right? Yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. Good, okay. So, um, okay, here we go. I'm going to view this up and then I'm going to play this and you'll find out about that other series of stills. This is a film on the very same subject. This is the end of the film. This is just the end. Thank you. 
Okay, now, now you know. Um, <clears throat> briefly, this was, this was the thing that kept me sane during COVID. I could, I, first of all, I'm a profoundly introverted person. And I could go up to this house where nobody was. It's in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. And uh, I was there alone with me and the spirits. And I made, I went at four seasons and worked and worked and worked and couldn't seem to make this thing come together. Didn't know how it could come together. The whole film is 24 minutes long. <clears throat> and it's the whole history of the house and the people in it. Um, and only in the very end, when I went up in the winter, there's no heat in the house. So uh, it, was, it was quite daunting. But in, in win the winter footage, when I started to put it together, told me how everything else should go, too. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that should be. Uh, but but it, was a, it was me working in the total middle of not knowing what I was doing and, and embracing that, or at least not not running screaming out, out the door. Um, when I got it done and COVID had not lifted, I thought, well, what's the difference between film and stills? And the only way to find out really, I mean, I could, could have made something up, but the only way to really find out was to go back and do it. So I went back, started again, four seasons. Once again, I mean, first I went to all the things that had looked gorgeous in the footage None of them worked as stills, not one of them. Um, then, again, I went back in the winter. No heat. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't sleeping there. No heat. And that's when that edit came together. And, and it, was, it was so different than, than, uh, than, than the film. It was really a completely different uh, project altogether. And... Again, what, what, what did I learn? Did, did I learn that I have a career in film? No, but I, I really was enlarged by both experiences and the similarity of them was that I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I've been working on a book about a friend of mine who was uh, a sculptor, does these enormous, huge granite pieces. And he, he was launched into art by an accident that compromised his, uh, his uh, left hemisphere. And he, he literally was blown out of, his, out of his left hemisphere into his right hemisphere. And he said this wonderful thing. He said, he said when, when I don't know what is happening, I know something is trying to happen and I trust it. Most of us don't trust it. Most of us, if we don't know what's happening and we feel ambivalent about it, we, if we're in Santa Fe, we say, well, I'm going to get out of the plaza and have a margarita. Maybe it'll all become clear then. Uh, and it doesn't. <laughs> but if you, if, you, if you can stay with it and trust that and stay with it wholeheartedly, um, or even in terror, <laughs> you know, um, it comes together. Mm. And can I say one more thing, John? I, Please. I, I just a few years ago, I lived near Yale, and they had a, the, uh, 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 what's his name, Richard Serra, gave a talk there. He went mm -hmm. to the art school. And um, so, of course, the, the room was full of uh, young students from the art school, and um, he took questions, which was fantastic. Kid raises his hand. He says, how do you get around your anxiety? How do you get past your anxiety so you can do your work? Sarah is ferocious. He said, you don't get past it. You start there. If you're not anxious about your work, it's because you haven't started it yet. And, you know, the whole, the whole room, all their ears were just pinned back by the ferocity of this guy. But he, he, he had this impulse of his own, which is, I don't want to make sculpture that is like a, a picture of something on a pedestal. I want to work directly with gravity. And I, I want to, I'd love to start all over again, the whole thing again. I wish I was 28. Uh, and work directly with, with perception, not even seeing, perception. Hmm. The film, and what the distinction film, are you making there? Yeah, it's, it's a big thing. I'm, I want to do a film, I started on it slowly, about air. 
Mm -hmm. Who does a movie about something you can't see? Well, a guy <laughs> named Sean Kernan would be, yeah, sure. Yeah. But... Let's get him. <laughs> <laughs> I completely understand uh, about the idea of making images about the invisible. Um, and I'm interested in your distinction between seeing and perception. Um, it, it, the, the, we can play with the words a little bit, yeah. but Paul yeah. Valeri had this wonderful statement. And when I read it, it was like listening to a key going into a lock, you know, the sound it makes. He said, seeing is forgetting the name of the thing one sees. Mm. And so, so if pursuing that, I would say that the way I'm using it, seeing is this is this, I, I like it, I don't like it, I respond to it, it reminds me of this, maybe I could do this, maybe I could try that. And, and uh, perception is this thing that happens in the right hemisphere, does no analysis, doesn't name it, doesn't do anything with it. The right hemisphere will hand it off to the left hemisphere for that kind of thing. But as it just stands there, there's this wonderful Tibetan phrase, it's, it's like being a child in a beautiful temple. <laughs> and is there space there for the other four senses maybe five yeah 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 absolutely mm. There's, it's not it's not even sensible it's 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 a mind experience uh rather than a sense experience sense sense are just doors but then it comes in here and it does this whirling thing mm. you know? Well, in order to have all those other sensations, you have to participate. So is there also a sense of participation in that mind set? Yeah, I mean, this, it's, um, it, it participates in you. I mean, the thing that's happening is not in the thing that's out there, the beautiful temple, it's, it's, it's in here. So, you know, is that, there's, Tony Dore, Reed, Reed knows who I mean, uh, who, who has this wonderful way of writing, which is he doesn't tell you what anybody thinks. He doesn't tell you what anybody, anybody's response is. He just sort of describes things that are going on and you have the response. And he said this wonderful thing. He said, it's, it's so easy to write, he was sad, but it's lazy. What you want to write is how the universe re reflects that sadness back to him. And then we all get sad, you know. And yeah. we have um, how do you kick yourself out of your ruts and find a new groove? With, with, um, Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> That's shorthand for, I often think that we need to get beyond our conventional training or conventional mind to get to that clearer, purer perception. We have habits that are very useful and yet we want to, to get beyond them, to discover more, to expand ourselves. So I'm just wondering what kinds of things you go to, to stimulate yourself, to expand yourself. Um, I leave home. You leave home. <laughs> and I look for things that, that scare me a little bit, you mm. know, like the boxing club, uh, which there was never any reason to be scared of that. But things that things that that I'm not scared of what happens out there. I'm scared of the intensity of my own response. It feels like shattering. It's it's you both want it and and you want to go have a margarita in the plaza. At the same <laughs> and is that also part of the impetus of trying all of these different things, these different mediums, these different approaches? They try me, you know, it's, a, it's just <laughs> one thing. It's just one thing. Uh, why did I spend 20 some years studying Chinese calligraphy with this woman to, so mm. I could be a well-known, respected <laughs> calligrapher? No. <laughs> But, but because a door opens, a door opens, and you see a, this incredible vista, and if you don't walk through it, you're an idiot. So I just go looking for doors. I go looking for, I was taking a walk down, down, down the road in, in Santa Fe near the school one morning, like about six o'clock in the morning, and there was a big gate there. And, the, and I was 
walking by and the gate went, I stopped. And I said, what's going to come out? I waited for about two minutes. Then it went, (laughs) I suppose to go, yeah, I think I was. I don't know what I missed. Um, you know, I, you and I could go on and have gone on for 25 years. <laughs> so we're, so we're getting quick, uh, you know, getting close to the Q and a with, with everybody else to invite into the chat. I, I did want to touch on, uh, a profound and really beautiful sense of silence. I'm, I'm really delighted that you presented the images without a lot of conversation, even though you said the, the first sequence was just seeing how things banged up against each other. I love that phrase. Um, there's a, a, a kind of wonderful, um, um, deliberately undeliberate quality, and yet it's still intentional. And I think that's very challenging to do. Um, it happens in the best turns in writing, when, and particularly in, in poetry. You're kind of looking for that unexpected twist. Um, and I'm just wondering about the, 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 the function of silence, how silent you feel you need to be to really get to that other level of perception and what the function of silence is in the presentation of the images and in the experience other people have of them. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, tell me why you're laughing instead. <laughs> I just mm. have this, this image that people might have of, of Mr. Zen here, you know, sitting, mm. sitting on the mountaintop waiting for just the fog to clear and the pine tree emerges and the, I'm not doing that. I'm, mm. I'm looking over at the next mountain thing. I wonder if I should be over there. I wonder if the light's better over there. And geez, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, have, I should have gone to the big Island and not, not Maui, you know, and, my own process is is um, is not serene, you know. Mm. Mm. It's not serene, and the, the the silence I don't know, man. <laughs> you got me all wrong. No, I you know I I, I feel like I do a, a, an unconscionable amount of churning with all this. I just make it look like silence. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And often it's the uh, the product, what we're looking for, it's the intentions, what we're looking for to find. Um, and we do the work in order to find it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. the work is is sometimes just banging your head on the wall, you know? <laughs> often, <laughs> more often than not. But um, I, I think so many times just getting involved in, in, in doing things. Can um, I ask you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I think the I our work looks so different, mm. and so I assume that the way we work is quite different. Um, and I just I just want to know a little bit about how when when you are in a place on something finding things, what is your what do you get? What is your what is your experience? Are you saying, ah, that would look lovely if I did this, or that would go with that, or are you doing what I would be doing, which is saying, none of it's working, for God's sake. (laughs) (laughs) I do have moments like that, but um, I love to plan before I get someplace. So I use storyboards, much like a filmmaker would, Mm -hmm. uh, to, to plan my shots and think through certain kinds of moves, certain kinds of themes and ideas I want to explore, but I, I always write my plans in pencil. Mm-hmm. I, I know that when I'm on the ground, I'm, I'm looking to discover what I've missed, what I haven't experienced yet, and I want, to, I want my plan to evolve. I think I've shared three of my favorite quotes with, quotes with you before. Uh, ben Franklin, planning not to plan is planning to fail. <laughs> Helmut von Moltke, no plan survives an encounter with the enemy. <laughs> and and finally, Paul Allen, you got to work your plan. So that's why I think the plan can really prepare you before you get there. But then just like you're talking about some of the, what I consider the conventional mind or to fix an idea or the naming of things, I mean, which language are you going to use? Which language is truer? 
right? Then, then I, th I, th I think once you're in the situation, you, you want to be more fully present. And that's, that's where I lean on all of the senses. I do crazy things like taste rocks. I, I shake trees and uh, wax sticks together to hear the sound. I ask questions like, how do you get the sound of the wind into your images? Or, or how do you get the temperature and the heat into these still things that you make? And um, I, th I think so much of that comes from just using the, the whole body as a physical um, embodiment, uh, an organ of sensation. We have, we have at least five. Uh, and move it through that space and time. And, and see what comes out at the end and then, you know, work your plan. <laughs> Something brand new might have come across. You, you, might, you might come across an idea that, uh, or a, a theme or a sensibility that uh, completely surprises you. And if it's fresher, if it feels more vital, run with it. Do you find it at the time or does it happen? Do you get back and it turns up or both, I guess? Both, you know, so many people for so long have asked me, do you pre-visualize or do you post-visualize? And I say, yes. And, and for me, the real question is, what happens when I pre-visualize? What happens when I post-visualize? Or, or more clearly, perhaps, how am I when I pre-visualize? How am I when I post-visualize? Because I know that when I approach things in different ways, I, I change. And by doing the work, you know, we are changed by the work we do, which, by the way, I think that's the real vulnerability of doing the work. I'm, if you say you're not always in control. Hard, am I going to leave a hard drive behind or a box of prints? No, but I'm, I'm going to leave me behind. Mm -hmm. or, you know. Yeah. Well, um, I think we should open it up to yeah. um, the rest of the folks who have joined us here. Uh, I, I know that we can go longer than the nine o'clock, but Reed will give us a hard cutoff at 9.15. And, and I've already seen some really wonderful comments and questions. Um, um, you know, I'm going to answer this one really quick in the chat. JP, you're able to be mindful with other people around you as you photograph. I have found that extraordinarily difficult, but with practice, I have found that you can do that. And it, it is, it's a practice. That's why they call it a practice. It's not a, you leveled up, you, you won the game. No, it's just, it's a constant practice. I, I think one of the hardest things that I had to learn over the years was to switch between making straight photographs and composites. Very different mindset. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's really paying attention to the people around you, the community, what's happening with the group, and then also uh, paying attention to what's going on inside of you in the place that you're in. Uh, I, I think one can expand one's sensibility, sensitivity there. And, and the very often seeing the same experience you're having through other people's eyes or through sen their sensibilities and watching them interact and, and react can be a really wonderful thing. And that's, that's one of the things I, I love about uh, a workshop is that when people do that and come away with such different results, such authentic results, uh, and, and people say, well, I didn't see it that way, or I didn't see that. It, that's really wonderful. I think that's what makes final reviews so magical. That's what makes all the good work good is you didn't expect it. Yeah. It's better than anything you had in mind, even if you had nothing in mind. You know, of all the conversations I've had, you know, there's 50 of them on the website. And then, of course, it's one of my favorite things to do is talk to folks like you. Um, that theme comes up again and again, that the artist's best work, whether it's Dad or Ansel Adams or Joyce Tennyson, or it's the images that surprise them lead to their greatest growth and often become the most celebrated images. So, Reed, I'm, I'm not sure if you see uh, um, particular questions that we should... Uh, move into let's let's I, I do absolutely and, and i will start at the beginning with the very first question that came in at 8:09 p.m at least that's my time here um from jeff shiwi and jeff says so is creativity a gift or a curse no seriously okay. it sometimes feels like a curse of course i'm happy to use it as my curse so Answer Jeff's question. Is creativity a gift or a curse? It's a gift that makes you curse sometimes. But most <laughs> it's just a gift. <laughs> I, I think creativity is a state. Mm. Whether you make anything in it or not. Um, and, and 
in in that it's it's the thing that happens to to you when you go to a a foreign place when you you know where you know nothing and you suddenly you defend yourself and you have a lot of ideas and then suddenly breaks and it opens out and that's the state that you're in take a picture write a poem but that's that's a way to think about creativity which is which is to me less daunting than uh, i got to do something with this hmm. and so that kind of cuts to uh laura's co- co- uh, question down there uh, what's the essence of creativity in photography or any other artistic medium? In many ways, what you just talked about there answers that, or at least gets it started. For me, it's always the aha moment. For me, creativity is a process of discovery. And there are many different ways of shepherding that discovery in many ways of making different kinds of discovery. What if you do something that is so far beyond yourself that it, that it that, that it kind of scares you. That it's it awesome, of, uh, it, It's awesome, but it scares the crap out of you, you know, at the well, same time. And then, and then you have to do it again, or you don't have to do it again. Exactly. It's like the Joe Pass, the jazz drummer. He says, whenever you make a mistake, do it again, like you meant to do that. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in, in school when I have, you know, my art crits, I say, you know, what is your intention, young man? If only I could have quoted Pee Wee Herman. I meant to do that, <laughs> but you got to mean it. <laughs> you got to own it. The thing is, there, there's create. The Greeks did not have a word or a concept of human creativity. They had art, which was techni, which it involves mm-hmm. making, obviously. Mm-hmm. But the Greeks felt that creativity was the province of the gods, mm-hmm. and, and they might deliver that to you. And if you could contain it, you could techni it. Right. Um, and so and that's where they came around with the ideas of genius. There was a, a genius in, inherent in every person, genius, genie, a spirit. There was also a genius of a place, a, a lo, genius locus, right? But they each also felt that individuals had their own diamond, D-A-E-M-O-N, their own kind of inner spirit <laughs> to struggle with and perhaps, you know, let the top off the bottle, let it out. <laughs> it's very interesting the way they looked at things there. And it's fascinating to see another person's perspective, another culture's perspective. I want to, I want to throw out that my, my favorite new assignment, not that new, uh, that I've given to classes and I have no clue if anybody's ever done it or not. And it is, take a picture that you will never show to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> you can show me. I mean, that, that, would, that would be all right. But but really, it's 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 going into an interior place that is so deep that you know, and a lot, a lot of people don't don't think much about this, particularly people who come to photography. But I think a lot. We both work with people who come to photography uh, after another career, after doing something else for a while, and and I think it's this child childlike impulse that that comes back and can't be named or understood and people are leery of getting too carried away with the woo woo but but it is it's it's the it is woo woo it's it's amazing and it's it's <laughs> the deepest part of this right right i remember sitting out um in front here uh, on my uh porch or patio with dad and keith carter and i remember years ago i wanted to teach a workshop out at santa fe called visual poetry uh, but I couldn't because Keith had already taken that <laughs> title. So I'm sitting there drinking gin with these two, watching them go on. I said, okay, gentlemen. So this poetry stuff we talk about, this metaphor you talk about, Dad, this poetry you're teaching, Keith, how do you know when you've got poetry in your images? <laughs> and they just pushed back. Maybe there was too much gin. I just got one of those magnificent Keith Carter smiles. Well, JP, I'll get back to you on that. (laughs) It is very hard to define. Uh, And in fact, I think it's so rich and so deep that it it avoids one easy description. I think there are, however, many different ways of describing it and approaching it. And that if we can be a little more articulate about the ways, the means, the the final results, um, 
perhaps each of us by doing our own work and showing our own creativity is is teaching each other the many possibilities of being creative but i i think there there are real benefits to being articulate about what creativity is how it happens how you can get it started uh, when you know it's not that's there where we, that's where we diverge right <laughs> I'm so glad we have something to disagree about. <laughs> um, that it's 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 it, that it is you know define love. Um, and I know that that being able to describe your work is is very important in art schools now. Um, I had a friend who was at Yale. He said we spent so much time defining ourselves and our place in the world of art that we never had any time to paint. Um, That's right. And why well, love. I look, I, could you imagine getting um, Arturo Rambo into, into a room and saying, uh, what, what is poetry? Can you explain it? Can you define it? How does, how does the drunken boat relate to the, you know, what would he say? Can you imagine? Yeah, I can. And in fact, I've, I've got on my list as I'm studying poetry very deeply this last year, um, about a hundred different definitions of what poetry is from all kinds of different poets. And they all have some piece to add to it. One of my favorite um, stories or parables is that Hindu parable of the five blind men feeling something up. One thinks he's got a column, another thinks he's got a spear, another a palm leaf, another a snake. And it's not until they put all of their impressions together, they figure, oh my God, we've got an elephant. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a joint thing. And that there are many ways of approaching it. And we have to acknowledge that our perception and our experience is limited, both by only five or six senses and by time, but that we have this amazing ability to share it with other people. So I don't want to just retreat to the woo-woo and say, well, you know, you know it when it's there. I, I think you can make substantial statements about just how good something is, but I also think it's so deep that you can't make one definitive statement. Plus also, we're still, every time you add a new human spirit into the equation, the whole thing grows. So it's, it's never static. I took a, I had this wonderful teacher in a writing class that I took about 15, 20 years ago. And um, she really, she really, I've stolen from her shamelessly. She's op she opened up so many ways of getting at things. And at the end of the class, there was this one guy and he said, you know, I've been so inspired by this class. I decided to apply um, to Yale in, and take a degree in, in English with a concentration on poetry, a master's degree. She said, why? He said, so I can learn to write poetry. She said, write poetry. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so Zach, do you, have a, do you have a question, Zach, for? Yeah, I do. Maybe? I like this one from Laura B. Solomon. What is the most meaningful thing you hope the viewer will gain from your work? And I think both of you can speak to that individually. Mm. If, it, if it knocked me out in ways that I can't articulate, I would like it to do that to the viewer. There's a, anybody can go look for this Roy de Carava picture of a hallway in Harlem. There's, there's nothing you can say about it. There's no, there's nothing, there's no mechanism there. There's nothing, but you look at it, a lot of photographers know this picture and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and the other thing I would say is that um, once you put it out there, it's not yours anymore. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I would answer, I, I would like to see a deep sense of connection and expansion through the natural world. The idea that we're not separate from it and that there's uh, an amazing sense of wonder uh, at being part of something so uh, immense, miraculous, again, like love, like art, indescribable and growing, but that we're a part of that. So if, if people felt inspired that they were a part of that and they took that back out into the world and did something of their own with that. Fantastic. What if, uh, I'll, I'll see if it comes up again. 
<laughs> hey, I, I have a question that, that I like that I'd like to hear the answer to. This is Donna asking the question, how do you nourish your creativity on a daily basis? Do you have a daily ritual that you find starts your creative process? Sounds like a JP question to me. Um, I have a really rich note-taking process. I, I now have migrated all of my notes to my phone with notes. Um, I, I, I take a ridiculous number of notes. I have one for image ideas, another for poetry. I've, I've written my three books of poetry in the last year on the phone. Uh, I consider some of the photographs notes. It's really just a, a mindfulness practice. Give you an example of, of how rich and useful I find this. I, I consolidated a number of notes into one note-taking thing, just as a kind of a daily journal, just one little line for gratitude, one little line for the one priority for the day. What was the high of the day? What was the low of the day? How am I feeling physically? Just a couple of quick little things, but in there was dreams. What did I dream? Dreams have always been very important to me. Um, as a result of having this one little note, a place to catch that and develop the habit uh, my dream recall has been higher than it's ever been in my life, uh, about 90 some percent. Uh, most nights I'm, I'm remembering something and it has to do with just checking into this little note. It doesn't have to be an iPhone, could be a piece of paper, whatever works, just developing the habit and, and making the small steps to say to the unconscious, to the conscious, this is significant and I'm willing to keep doing it. So, um, Note-taking as a form of mindfulness has been tremendously useful to me. Um, and then other things in terms of inspiration. I, I'm always looking at other people's work. I, I found this year particularly challenging because of what everybody else is going through. It's hard to tune into the news. It just, it just hurts to watch that much suffering. And so I just made a deal with myself. I wouldn't look at any of that stuff until after lunch. And then I would start every morning by just quietly reading some poetry, meditating, maybe doing my workout, looking at the birds, that, that calm kind of tune into something heartfelt was, was very helpful for me. And I, I find it's, for me, it's much easier to do that first thing in the morning when I'm closer to dreams. I just feel a little more open, a little more sensitive. And I haven't run through gearing up into my email and the other things I have to do and answering the phone call. I haven't gotten into that busy mind. I'm still, still quieter first thing. John, do you have a practice that you know works for you? There's a, there's a wonderful phrase from, I think it's Dogen, the, um, the Zen Japanese Zen master. And he said, if you walk in the mist, you get wet. And I walk in the mist. I'm, I'm much less, I have no practice. I, I have a practice, which is to stop as often as much as I can stop thinking, stop trying to figure it out. Uh, you know, if I, if I want to get a tan, I go stand in the sun and that, but, but then I, when I'm not actually doing that, I'm worrying about it. You know? I, mean, it's, I wish I had a serene thing to say, but I don't, but there's, you know, I have, um, I was discovered some years ago to have a thing that I always had which is attention deficit disorder. And when I heard what, how, how it played out, um, it was, of course, that's the answer. That's, that's me. So um, at this point, what I'm doing with that, I'll just say one phrase, default mode network. Look it up, it explains everything, including politics. <laughs> so be awake. Be awake, practice being awake. Don't reject anything. Even if it's chaotic, don't reject it. If you want to make a chaotic piece of work out of it. I, from my problem is I think I clean things up too much. I'd like to, I'd like to do something nice and messy and, and stop having people say, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> you know, so people think of nature as a drop of water hanging from a, from a, um, a leaf and in the water is refracted Mount Fuji and they say, ah, very zen. Tsunamis are, are nature too, you know? 
It's all the meat, it's all the material. So Zach, we have time for one more question. I'm gonna let you have it. So either ask a question yourself or pull one from our audience. I think I'm gonna ask this one by Giannis Miglovs, and I hope I pronounced that right, because I think it's kind of a challenging question, or at least it challenges what some of the things you guys said today, which I find interesting. So it says, they say, create images words cannot describe, but words touch a different part of the brain. Suggestions for how to combine, to titillate more of the mind to that divine presence. Could you say that again? Yes, absolutely. So she's, they admit, create images that cannot, create images that words cannot describe, but the words touch a different part of the brain. Do you have any suggestions for how to combine more of the mind to that divine presence, to that silence? I guess they're asking, do you have a way to kind of explain that idea after the fact? We want images to speak for themselves, but at what point do you talk about them? When do you start to use words to describe what you're doing? Uh, I, that's, that's, that's a terrific question. And what I think is, um, I, I think the most wonderful, purest form is music, okay? What does music mean? What does this note mean? What does it mean when you put it with that one? I, th I think sometimes you have to leave it where it is, you know, and not bring it, not say, can I describe this? Can I put this in words? Words, there, there was a guy, he's Belgian. He, he was doing a lot of work with uh, psychedelics, acid and stuff. And he said, I'm tired of reading metaphorical descriptions about what goes on during a trip. I'm gonna write this down, not as metaphor, just as direct experience. You should see it. <laughs> mm. It it is it means it's notation. It means absolutely nothing. There are no words. There are lines. There are things that look like words and that kind of thing. So some things don't come out, but but they really change in there, and that gets back to default mode network and addiction and depression and so forth. That things are going on there. And you got to go there if you want them to go on. You can't necessarily bring them out in words. You can, and sometimes you can. JP, um, I think talking about pictures is is extremely challenging, but also extremely useful. Um, I, I would encourage people to write in a way that it opens doors and windows, rather than leads people down one path. And there can only be one path. And I think that's one of the reasons why I often recommend people write statements, more than one statement in, in two, two or three totally different ways to give different lenses on the same subject. Or um, I love it when a book has uh, a piece of writing by the author and a piece of writing by somebody else who has this outside perspective. Um, I think a book to really look at and I, I was delighted to meet Teju Cole, who wrote the book Blind Spot. It's a tremendous dialogue between the images in the picture. And it's so not literal and not obvious. The, the two take similar paths, sometimes parallel, sometimes oblique, sometimes they converge, sometimes they diverge. But there's still this gestalt, uh, the same shared spirit and set of concerns. And so the words offer a lens into some of the underlying concerns of the images without explaining the pictures. It's a very living kind of animate process. And, and one of the things I've really come to appreciate this year is ekphrastic poetry, poetry that's written in response to other art forms. And it's more of a celebration and a personal interpretation, sometimes highly subjective, but very individual and authentic. And I think that's a great way to celebrate the power of art and the individual reaction and, and why it means so much to, well, anyone can write poetry. You just have to keep it simple. Take a look at haiku. But you, you want to get in touch with how it really touched you and then maybe share that with other people. So... There are many ways to do that. And I think we have been living through decades of the tyranny of art speak. I went through a lot of it and I had the same experience of learning how to talk a painting rather than make a painting. And it is why I left Yale 
after I learned to endeavor to eschew obfuscation. I despise my mass disquisitional prolixity, and I just try and keep it simple. Like Einstein says, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. Very hard to do. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That was a difficult question. So I appreciate you both ask, answering. Yeah, Janice is awesome. I've, I've, you know, he's steady with me. We've spent some time. He's, he's really, he's doing some really spirited work. So thank you for that, Janice. Can I tell you a great response that I got, which probably means more to me than anything. When I, I sent Jay Maisel a uh, link to the film about my grand, great grandfather's house, he left a message on my answering machine. He said, Sean, you made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Master of pith. <laughs> He's wonderful. His books are very good too. I mean, Talk about some beautiful, simple statements. The ones that were done with Peach Pit through Kelby. Uh, those two, two books of Jay's were the selection of his images and just his observations about looking. That's, that's a very interesting parallel of text and image to, to look at. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. All right, Reed. We could go on and on and on, I'm sure. Let's do it again. Uh, for, for now, <laughs> we will call it to a close, but yeah, let's do it again. I think we could we could open up this, maybe we'll do another one in the winter with the two of you, how about that? So uh, thank you both, thank you, Sean. Thank you, JP. Thank you, Reed. Thanks uh, really wonderful you, evening. I really enjoyed it. And I know that our, our audience did too, just based on the comments in the chat and the questions, and we only got to a few questions and there were uh, over 20 of them. So anyway, we will do it again, I promise. Uh, upcoming, Sean has an online workshop with us. It starts the 20th of October. It's called Looking, Looking. Uh, check it out on our website. And then here are links. Do a screenshot, if you'd like, of um, these links from Sean and JP with, with uh, their websites and, and books and uh, great information on the creative process. So thank you one and all for joining us tonight for Creativity Continues here at the workshops. And we look forward to seeing you again with one of these evenings or online. We've got some in-person workshops coming up. We've got it all going on at this stage and I'm grateful. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll see you again at some point in the near future. Good night all, all. thanks. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Adios.